It's time to open up our mailbag and answer some questions from the listeners next on Locked on Royals. You are Locked on Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are tuned into another edition of Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, I am your host, Jack Johnson, and you can find me on Twitter or X at JohnnyJ underscore 15, or you can find us on wherever you get your podcasts. That can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, we're on Odyssey, and we're on YouTube. Just be sure to hit the follow button and subscribe. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. There's no better time to get in on the action. You got the NBA playoffs. You've got MLB in full swing, of course. So start placing some bets and winning some money today over at FanDuel. If you're a first-time listener and you want to know a little bit more about me, I'm based here in Kansas City. I work at Sports Ready Weight 10 WHB. Do some hosting, co-hosting, and producing as well. So along with that and this podcast, I stay pretty busy in the sports world. Now, I do have a little bit of an update in terms of next week. I'll be on vacation, so I'm going to be out of town, of course, not going to be here for the homestand. And I originally said was not going to do episodes at any point throughout the week. That's now changed. I am going to do at least two episodes. Um, Hopefully going to get that in before... Maybe Tuesday. I think Tuesday will be the goal for the first episode to come out. And then I might do Friday, Thursday or Friday uh, before the road trip begins in Tampa with another episode out there. So not going to be completely MIA all of next week. Just not going to be as consistent. And I would also say that maybe the background and the camera quality might not be the best, but I'm going to do my best at least to make sure that it's a good 30-minute episode at some point throughout next week. Uh, Could also be back-to-back days. I don't really know. I'm going to see how it's all going on the vacation, but not to worry. I will be able to get at least something out there for uh, the the homestand against the Tigers, and then, of course, the road trip against Tampa Bay. So stay tuned for that. It is Friday, which means the Mailbag Friday. We're going to answer some questions from the listeners, and we're going to dive right into it. This one comes from Bobby Witt Jr.'s bat. Any chance that Brent Rooker stays in Kansas City after this series? Well, the Royals seem to fumble the bag with Brent Rooker after 2022 when they gave him like 12 at-bats, deemed he wasn't going to be competing for a spot the following season. Oakland picked him up. He was an all-star last year and is their best hitter in 2024. I will say this, though. The Royals weren't the only team to fumble Brent Rooker, if you will. The Padres... I didn't think he was going to turn into much. The Twins didn't think he was going to turn into much. So it wasn't like this was a Royals draft prospect. Didn't work out here. And then he goes and thrives elsewhere. That's Ryan O'Hearn. Brent Rooker, not really the same story. And the Royals barely had him. But for this season, no. I don't think Brent Rooker is going to be coming back to Kansas City. I would imagine that somebody on the National League side will be calling for Brent Rooker. The Royals can make a play for him. But I just don't know if the Royals have what Oakland may be looking for and one of their top trade chips coming up at the deadline. This one comes from Royals Chiefs. Who is your draft draft crush for the Royals at six? Mine is Connor Griffin. I do love Connor Griffin. I think he's the best prep player uh, that's going to be available at that spot. But for a draft crush, it's hard not to be excited about somebody like Chase Burns. I think Chase Burns is going to be available. The flamethrower out of Wake Forest. Kind of similar uh, to Paul Skeen's repertoire, who was just fantastic at Wrigley Field today. More so a draft crush because I would love to see 100, 101, 102 in the Royals rotation. However, there is risk with signing somebody or drafting somebody that throws that hard. Injury concerns could be a problem. And also, Burns' overall numbers in college aren't as dominant as Skeen's were. But I do think that he would qualify as a draft crush, at least for me. This one comes from Steven. The Royals have to make some kind of move soon, right? I don't know if they have to right now. Um, They could be calling around for all I know. They could be trying to make some moves to bolster this lineup. I just don't think there's going to be many teams biting. Uh, We're not going to see a ton of trades before the deadline because also some teams are going to want to maximize the value 
and wait till buyers get more desperate. I think the recent stretch of the offensive struggles have been certainly noticeable. I'm not going to make excuses for it. I just don't know if it's more likely one bat fixes that or some of these guys hit their way out of a slump. The next move I would see would probably be to help the bullpen out a little bit. Walter Pennington, we talked about in yesterday's episode. I think he's an option. Overall, though, I just don't know if I see any immediate moves happening. I could be shocked. I could be floored. I could be surprised. But right now, I just don't get that sense that a roster move or a trade is going to be happening. Eli asked thoughts on the Royals trading for either Mauricio Dubon from the Astros or Tyler O'Neill from the Red Sox. Well, the Royals were interested in Tyler O'Neill in the offseason. Uh, curious to if Boston is already thinking they're going to be a seller. For the Astros, they're starting to make a little bit of a push after such a bad start to the year. Mauricio Dubon seems like a, a Royal, just a, a light-hitting infielder, super utility guy. It'd be maybe worth a call, but does Dubon really help that lineup a ton? I don't think it, it he would help it as much as Tyler O'Neill would, but the asking price might be a little bit higher for Tyler O'Neill. Those are good candidates, though, right there. I think those are two interesting names to watch. I'm trying to compile my own list right now if the Royals are going to be buyers at the deadline, and I would probably include two of those names. Maybe uh, Tyler O'Neill would be too tough to get, but if the Royals had interest in him in the offseason, which it sounded like they did, I'd imagine they'd at least make a phone call if Boston is indeed sellers and the Royals are indeed buyers. This question comes from Blaze. If the Royals are targeting an outfielder, who would be some candidates to acquire and what would the trade package look like? Well, uh, it's a perfect time to answer that question coming off the previous one we just did. Uh, Jesse Winker is somebody that I think wouldn't be too expensive to go out there and get. And the Nationals aren't playing their best baseball right now. Now they're sub 500, but Winker was really bad last year and seemed to bounce back early on with Washington. But he's one of those high OBP guys that might be doing what the Royals had hoped Hunter Renfro would be doing, which was return a little bit back to the form that he was two years ago and not so much one year ago. So Jesse Winker is one of those guys um, trying off the top of my head to go for some outfielders. I mean, if you look at some of the teams that are tanking, I mean, Miami, I think a lot of people are going to talk Jazz Chisholm. That would be a little bit more of a hefty price. Uh, sticking with Miami, I mean, you have Brian De La Cruz, Jesus Sanchez. Uh, those asking prices would be higher, but Miami's going to be in full fire sale mode, in my opinion. I think they're going to completely tear down. So in my opinion, they would be worth a call. Uh, but if you're going to be going after those young guys in Miami, you're going to have to part ways with maybe one or a few of your top five prospects in the system. KC Sports fan, KU Plus Mizzou asks, what happens first? Waters getting called up or the Royals making some kind of trade for an outfielder? This is a great question, and it's one that I'm even going back and forth on. I would say by the odds, Drew Waters has a better chance to be called up sooner rather than later. And, you know, the Royals have to have a lot go right to make a trade. They have to get in the right price range. They got to feast on a team that's selling. That player has to be trending upward enough where it makes sense for the Royals, but also not trending too high where then he gets out of that price range. And Drew Waters is so close, uh, considering what he did last night. He was four for six. He's now hitting 317. His walk rate is still above 10%. Strikeouts are still a little bit of a problem, but the way he's hitting, I don't know if it's too much of a concern for me at this point. So I'm going to say it's more likely Waters gets called up than the Royals are to make a trade. Uh, this one comes from Jeff. Which postseason do you look back more fondly on, 14 or 15? For me, it's 2014. Love this question. It's a 2014 reunion that kicks off at Coffin Stadium. They were down at Union Station the other day, and then it's going to be the HGH bobblehead weekend. Should have some pretty big crowds because of the nice weather. And it's a memorable team that's coming back. I know it's weird to say the year you fell short is more memorable, but I think I'm with you here. 2014 was such a unbelievable ride because we were all experiencing it for the first time if you weren't alive during the 1985 World Series championship. I mean, to go three decades, basically, without any success and to then make a run like that all the way to Game 7 of the World Series, I remember every single game. I remember every single moment. And not to say 2015 wasn't as 
magical because they had the game four in Houston. They had the game six against Toronto. Uh, they'd beaten two really good teams to get to the World Series and then some dramatic games in the World Series. Hosmer's mad dash, you know, making Matt Harvey blow that game in the ninth, the Daniel Murphy booted ground ball. I remember a lot from both years, but considering 2014 was the first time we were all going through that in a long time, I'm going to have to say that because it also has the best game that's ever happened, in my opinion, in Royals history, which was the wild card game. A little bit of bias, but hard to find a better, better game than that, in my opinion. Okay, we're going to take our first break of the show. When we come back, still plenty of more questions to get into next on Locked on Royals. You are tuned into Locked on Royals on the Locked on Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can find me on Twitter X at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. Before we go any further, a shout out to one of our newer sponsors out there in Supply House. Get supplies from the site that's made for the skilled trades. Supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry-leading service from the friendliest folks in the business and talk to a real person every time pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining supplyhouse.com's free trade master program every trade master gets access to a dedicated phone line free shipping and discounts on every order join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at supplyhouse.com slash tm and order plumbing hvac and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at supplyhouse.com we are going to hop back onto Twitter here and answer some of the questions that we got here. This one is going to come from Aiden. Fans have been throwing out the idea of trading for Joe Adele, but I feel like he'll be too expensive for the Royals. Your thoughts on this? The tough part about Joe Adele is the Angels don't have a lot of trade assets. That's a bad baseball team, and they don't have a lot of talent over there. And Joe Adele being a former top prospect, top 100, and bursting out into a career year, I think the Angels are going to want to maximize that. Uh, I think the Royals are going to make a call. However, you run the risk of, is this just fool's gold right now? Is this a guy that is just hot at the right time? He's having a good first 50-game sample size. And is it going to project well enough in the second half? That's going to be the big question everybody's asking about Joe Adele. I think that price is going to be a little bit high because I think he's still got a couple years of control, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm wrong, just let me know in the YouTube comments or Twitter. But I think it's worth a call. You, you need help in the outfield, and I think he'd be an upgrade, whether it be in center field or right field. He absolutely ripped apart the Royals in Anaheim, so that alone should have grabbed the attention of the Royals front office. Worth the call, going to be expensive, but maybe not too expensive for Kansas City. This question comes from Jeff. Between now and the end of June, what do you think the Royals' record should be considered? Uh, they're still in contention in the month of September. Best or best and worst case scenario. Uh, by the way, have fun on your vacation. Thank you so much, Jeff. Definitely going to have fun on it, but we're going to be bringing you two episodes while I'm out there. Just uh, give me a little bit of a break on, on the overall camera quality in the background. It's not going to look like this. You remember when I was in Surprise, Arizona, and we had the, the white wall in the background, kind of the glare from the camera. Uh, not the prettiest looking thing. But I guess all that matters is the content, right? I can have a really bad background. Did for a number of the first episodes I did. Did not have a good setup at all. I can admit that. Uh, but I am going to bring you at least two episodes on vacation coming up uh, next week. But for this question, at the end of June, let's see. That would be roughly around, you know, getting to that 80 game mark. I think it's between 70 and 75. If you can be anywhere really between one and five games over 500, I think that gives you a, a fighter's chance, a, a puncher's chance, if you will. And for the Royals to compete in September, they're going to have to survive June. And, you know, if it's a 28 to 30 game sample size, I mean, the goal is for this homestand, I would hope they can sweep either Oakland or Detroit and win the other series. Because that way you're looking like you're 10 games over 500. 
You're going to have a a really tough road trip coming up. You want to make sure you're between eight and 10 games over 500 by the time May ends. So you have that buffer room in June where if you finish five games below 500 that month, you're still three games over. So to me, anywhere from one to five games over 500 is the goal for the Royals to be competing in September. And the longer they can hold off a bad stretch, the better that's going to be. Of course, that's a very simple thing to say, but if you have a a bad stretch in August, you just hope at that point you're 10 games over 500 and you only drop down to six games over 500 and still absolutely in the hunt. So that I think is my record goal for this team at the conclusion of June and for them to still be competing going into September. Ben has two questions here. This one comes from, uh, is a closer a need in the future if MacArthur continues to suck? And if so, who could we possibly make a trade for? And also a two-parter here, just thought of this, but when the hell is Lyles coming back? Um, I don't think the Royals are going to be looking for a closer. And James MacArthur, I think, is being a little bit blown out of proportion. Um, He has given up home runs and back-to-back save situations, but they were solo home runs. And he ended up locking down the save. The Milwaukee game with Willie Adamas and the three-run bomb wasn't good at all. But I also think he's a guy that when he gets right again, He's going to be just fine. We're not going to be talking too much about it. And I don't think the Royals like too many of the options out there for a closer. I think the better option would be trying to get guys to bridge the gap to James MacArthur. You know, I think Tanner Scott is a very intriguing option out of Miami. Was fantastic last year. Struggling a little bit this year, but throws still upper 90s from the left side. He's got a sinker, wipeout stuff. He's Miami's closer, but I think you could bring him in and become the the setup guy alongside John Schreiber and gives a different angle. You have righty with the Schreiber, lefty with uh, Tanner Scott, and then Justin Lawrence, uh, a guy out of Colorado, kind of a submarine-looking arm that throws 95, 96, 97 with a wipeout sweeper. Two guys right there I really like out of the bullpen from two teams that are in last place, though Colorado's won seven or eight in a row. I think they still haven't lost, so maybe they're not going to be as much of sellers as we think, but those are two bullpen arms. I really like. And as for Jordan Lyles, look, there's there's no update. I mean, he's off with his family, and you just hope at this point everything's all right, and there is no timetable. I, I can tell you completely and honestly that, that there's just not a a good feel right now of, of what the, the time's going to look like. Uh, if he could be gone as much as next week, one more week and he's back, or he could be gone the entire season. I really don't know. Uh, you just hope at this point everything is going all right with his family. Uh, Charles asked, when Carlos Hernandez comes back, what type of situations do you think he'll be used in? I'd imagine very similar to last year, although right now he's struggling in Omaha, so I don't think the Royals are in any you know, any mood to rush him back. I'd imagine he'd be a sixth and seventh inning guy, could take some of those outings from a Chris Stratton or a Nick Anderson or even a, a Will Smith. Uh, the Royals need to get some high power in that bullpen. And, the fact that Carlos Hernandez and John McMillan are struggling so heavily in Omaha, it does concern you a little bit. But I'd imagine it'd just be a one-inning you know, workload that he's getting in the sixth or the seventh inning. That, I feel like, is the best option for him. I don't see him being a closer. Don't see him being opener like he was last year because the Royals' rotation is doing just fine. The next question comes from Tom. Rotation has thrown a ton of innings early in the year. How are they planning to combat that workload come July and August? Well, we also know that some of these guys are not going to be throwing six, seven innings every single time out. I mean, Seth Lugo is a quality start machine. Uh, Cole Reagans, you know, is going to be able to work deep into games. But I don't think you need to be concerned about, you know, the early inning or early season workload. I mean, they need somebody to go 200 innings. And right now it looks like Seth Lugo can be that guy. I have my doubts because he's only been a full-time starter once in his career. And he only threw... 140 some innings last year. That was kind of Zach Greinke territory of last year and the year before that. So I don't know if he's going to make a 60 inning jump, but he's also you know, among the best in the league in innings pitched so far. You'd like to think Cole Reagans can, but he's had a short outings that he may not be able to get there. Right now, I think you can certainly be worried about somebody like a Cole Reagans getting to September and maybe having that fatigue of not throwing over 160, 170 innings before. I think the career high was right under 100 innings, if I'm not mistaken. So they're going to play that right. Um, there might be some times this season they could do some spot starts and and give them a little extra rest or add a sixth start in the rotation. But I don't think 
it's necessarily a bad thing. They're, you know, working so deep into games early on in the year because these guys also, you know, are hoping to be working deep into games in July and August. But if it starts to get a little bit more of a fatigue problem, I'd imagine they'd bring up Daniel Lynch or Jonathan Bowen to be a six starter or go with an opener and, you know, piece it together from that point on. Okay, before we move on to our final set of questions, we want to give a shout out to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. When we come back, we'll wrap up our Mailbag Friday next on Locked On Royals. You are tuning to Lockdown Royals and the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can find us on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. And you can find us on wherever you download your podcast. And we are on YouTube. Just be sure to hit the follow button and subscribe. Want to give a shout out to our title sponsor today in FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning. $5 bet. That's 150 bucks to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And know that the Royals are favorites tonight, so if you want to place a little wager on that, uh, certainly wouldn't hurt when you got Cole Reagans on the mound facing a lineup that hasn't gotten a hit off him before. Of all the guys on the roster for Oakland, 0 for 18. Only six guys had faced him. Not a ton of them in the lineup tonight. But hopefully Cole Reagans can bounce back and maybe you win some money, but do so over at FanDuel. All right, our last round of questions here. Uh, this one is going to come from Satchel's page. Did it seem like the Royals were attempting to lift the ball more in the Seattle series? About every swing and miss or batted ball looked like a bat path was under the ball. Is this a coaching thing they believed would give them an advantage with the fastball throwing opponent? Very well thought out question there. I didn't notice too much that uh, they were lifting the ball. And I remember in surprise, uh, Seren Petro and I were chatting with Alex Zumwalt, and it was about Michael Garcia and his, you know, ability to hit the ball so hard. And we asked, you know, should he start lifting the ball? Do you want him to lift the ball? And he said, no. He said his swing is is just how I like it, you know, down and easy through the ball, throwing the hands at the ball, hitting a line drive. That's what you hope for as a hitting coach. But maybe it was just, you know, Seattle had such a good, three pitchers they were they were putting out there such a good group of arms there in the rotation so to me it really does feel like I I don't feel that it is I don't feel it's that big of an issue I guess that's what I'm trying to say here of of the lifting the ball because you know it, it would mean if you're hitting the ball hard and you're lifting it it's going to leave the yard if you're hitting the ball hard and you're pounding it in the ground, probably going to be a ground out. Uh, but I, I didn't notice it maybe as much as you did. Uh, that is very interesting to me. Um, but I don't think it's cause for concern. Right now, I think uh, some of the approaches have been a little bit poor, and that's putting it lightly. That, that's maybe being too easy on some of the guys. And also falling by, behind in the count over and over again. Swinging at pitches that are out of the zone, that may be leading to some of those ugly pop-up type of swings. But I didn't think it was coming from everybody. I think it was an overall just bad road trip offensively. I think outside of that 10-run or 11-run performance they had against the Angels, they just weren't very good. They were relying on their pitching and their bullpen to win them those, those games. Uh, this question comes from Mason. Do we know what the story is behind the this pinky eye celebration? I've wanted the same thing. I believe Annie Rogers did a story on it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I do believe that... Oh, I, I think there was something behind it and it's already been reported. I could be wrong on that. I don't know personally. I would love to ask next time I'm out at Kauffman Stadium once I'm back from vacation, uh, but definitely would love to know just like you because it seems to have picked up steam. However, I will say this. Sometimes in baseball, I remember when I worked in independent league ball for the Monarchs here in Kansas City, they had a celebration they did. And when we'd ask them about it, they wouldn't tell us. They said, oh, that stays in the clubhouse. So it might be something that stays in the clubhouse. But I swore I thought there was a story done by Annie Rogers earlier in the season. Could be wrong on that. Annie does great work, so it wouldn't shock me if there was um, a story out there that has the explanation for that pinky eye uh, celebration thing that they do after every single base hit. Jason asks, any idea why Pennington was being stretched out to four innings? Are they grooming him to be a starter? 
I was interested in that as well with Walter Pennington being a opener, if you will, for four innings. But I don't think they view him as a starter. I think that was maybe to lengthen him out a little bit of being a multiple inning guy in Kansas City instead of just a one inning type of to type of pitcher. Because I, I do think the Royals will find more value for him if he can go three or four innings. You know, and I thought what really intrigued me about the four inning outing is do they view him maybe taking that spot from Matt Sauer? You know, if you need a guy to throw three to four innings, you don't want to burn on Hell Serpa or or burn Daniel Lynch if he's in the bullpen. You know, Walter Pennington can be that guy that can shut it down for one inning, or you could turn to him in a three or four inning workload when the game's out of hand. Whether you are the team that's getting blown out or you are the team that is blowing out someone else, it doesn't hurt to have a guy that you can trust to go multiple innings. And that maybe to me is why I think they did it. Of just showing Walter Pennington's more than a one inning guy. And maybe wanted to showcase him a little bit more of, yeah, it's not just, you know, 15, 16 pitches that he's throwing in an outing. He might be able to throw 40, 45, 50 pitches uh, in one outing. So I want to see Walter Pennington in Kansas City. I made that very apparent in yesterday's episode. I just think it was more so to show the versatility uh, that he can do. And lastly, this question comes from 643 Royals. Also does great work uh, putting out during the game. Uh, updates and everything like that, kind of a play-by-play, if you will, scoring updates. So if you can't watch the game, give 643 Royals a follow. They do fantastic work over there, uh, really working his butt off on social media. So if you can't watch the game, want to get those updates, I suggest following and uh, turning on the notifications so you can get those updates quickly because not everybody does the updates, you know, every single inning and stuff like that and substitutions, pitching changes, all things that could be happening throughout the game. But he asks, Number one, how do you see the Royals stacking up against the Twins and the Guardians in the AL Central? Do you think all three teams are legit? I don't think all three teams are legit. I think it'll come down to two. However, the teams that finish third and fourth aren't going to be that far behind from number one and number two, to be honest with you. But in terms of a legit playoff team, I think there's only two. And right now the Royals are showing they can hang, but the team that I think I still fear the most is Minnesota. I I think Minnesota is a team because of last year, because of their bullpen, some of the guys they have in their lineup, and the Royals' success against Minnesota over the last couple of years, which hasn't been much, they're the team that strikes more fear in me than Cleveland does. And Cleveland has come back down to earth a little bit. They're still in first place. I just don't know if they're going to have the lineup to make a late push. And I'm sure Cleveland fans are saying the same thing about the Royals. They don't have the the long-term ability to be there in September. They haven't done it in quite some time. So I think all teams are kind of nitpicking who's actually good, who's not very good, and why they're not very good. Uh, But I do think right now the Royals stack up well enough because uh, they've got a rotation that's thriving, and they have an offense that's feast or famine, and sometimes it does work out in their favor. And number two, the Pirates' chances of making the playoffs are slim. What do you think Connor Joe is as a hypothetical trade target? Connor Joe is kind of in that, you know, realm of somebody that's really, you know, busting out this year, uh, turning into a career year. Pittsburgh, I think, is going to hold off on being sellers. I mean, Paul Skeens was great yesterday or today. Um, they have Jared Jones as well. They're only three or four games under 500. And then I know Central is weird to me. Um, so I don't know if they're going to be complete sellers. And they might just say, you know, Connor Joe's somebody they want next year as well. And they're not willing to give up. Uh, on a guy like him. So I'm going to say they're slim, kind of like the the Pirates' playoff chances, just because I don't think they're going to be severe sell- sellers at the deadline. But do think it's a very intriguing option. The Royals are going to need a batter, too, if they really are going to make a push in September. I'd be very interested if they were to make a call to the Pirates about Connor Joe. Well, that's going to do it for another edition of a Mailbag Friday on Locked on Royals. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. One last shout out to Locked On Sports today. It's here for you 24 7, covering the top sports story of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today now, available for free on the Fire TV channels app. Now, a programming reminder I actually will have two episodes next week. Not sure which days they're going to fall on, but two will be coming your way. So we won't have a complete week of radio silence on our end. But until then, I will talk to you from vacation, Kansas City.